Yeah. How's it going, everyone? My name is Nathan Shaw. I'm here at the Shot Clock Podcast. I'm joined by Jordan Schultz, ESPN analyst. Jordan, thank you for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Uh, more than happy to have you on. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. Appreciate you having me. So, I mean, working, you work with CJ McComb on the pull-up pod, which is amazing to me because I'm such a huge CJ McComb fan. And I love what the Blazers are doing. So what's that like to kind of work with the NBA player firsthand every day? You know, CJ is, uh, he's a special guy. You know, um, we, uh, we had a relationship, Nathan, before the podcast. Um, his assistant coach and prior to that, his bet uh, in Portland was Earl Watson. And I kind of grew up with Earl. We, we were really tight and still are. And he had told me years back, he said, you got to meet this kid, CJ McCollum at a Lehigh. He said, uh, he's a journalism major. He's, he's a really cool guy. And you guys will hit it off regardless of basketball or not. So I said, great, you know, let's, let's set it up. And that was probably CJ's rookie year, I think, maybe his second year. And at that point, he wasn't playing a lot. And I think he was dealing with, you know, adjusting to the NBA lifestyle. And he was interested to talk to another journalism person. And we really hit it off and ended up forming a really good friendship. And then when the podcast opportunity came along, um, we, we had that foundation and the blueprint for success I think for us was just like talking life, talking hoops. We both share a big interest in wine and he has now has this new wine label in Oregon that's uh, completely popped off and it's selling out everywhere. So, you know, CJ is, uh, he's a great basketball player, but to hang out with him and be around him and get to know him has been a blessing because a lot of our conversations don't revolve around hoops. We do talk a lot of basketball, don't get me wrong, but um we we've had some really like for me like life almost life-changing conversations where i really learned about his background how he grew up his family and what motivates him um and it's been it's been a really special experience over two years yeah i mean you talked about the blueprint for success and you guys got nominated for a webby award uh, in the yeah. spring, i believe so how huge was that for you you know that was huge we had uh the, the first year we got some recognition from Esquire as a top podcast. And then uh, the Webby Award, we didn't win, but uh, to get nominated was really cool. There were some other great, you know, podcasts. And uh, I, I was really honored by it. I mean, you know, when you attach yourself to someone like CJ McCollum, when you're, for me, being that fortunate enough to experience that with him, um, I always felt like uh, uh, extra motivated to bring it because, I feel like, okay, this podcast needs him way more than it needs me, <laughs> you know? And so I always tried to, and I still, you know, I try to have a lot of fun with it and be open, but um, also allow him to dictate most of the conversation because I'm very uh, realistic that fans want to hear more from CJ. You know, I always say it's like in, if some people would say, oh, it's 50-50 talk, I'd say it's like 80-20, maybe 85-15 percent, like, CJ's the guy and I'm just there to, you know, steer the conversation the way it needs to, but uh, he's, he's been awesome and he prepares for it. He spends time on it. We exchange ideas, you know, during the week and really take, uh, take pride in it. And I think it's grown. Um, you know, I think it has 100 and, 104, 105 episodes. So it's, it's been a long time and it's been a lot of fun. Now I do got to ask, who do you think is the more iconic duo when it comes to podcasting? You and you and CJ or JJ Reddick and his co-host? We, you know, we joked about this and I always say we do because JJ doesn't do it every week, Nathan. He does it, you know, more sporadically, but I think JJ's is great. I love, I listen to it. Uh, I don't think I've missed one of his podcasts in a long time. Like he really, he's funnier than I think almost anybody even realized. Like he's a, JJ's really funny. He's really smart and he's worked super hard to get to this point. And his career, he's made a lot of money. He doesn't, it's not like he needs to do the podcast, but he's very honest. And because, you know, like CJ, guys really like JJ, they respect him. I think guys are very open to sharing their experiences on and off the court. So I, I do like JJ's a lot, but uh, I'm going to go with, 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 uh, we'll see. So I want to talk about your career a little bit and how you got into it. So basically, I mean, you start out, I'm assuming you start out young, correct? Or Yeah, I mean, uh, I pretty much um, started getting going in college and then uh, after school, you know, definitely revved up. What was that first moment for you where you're kind of like, this is what I want to do in life. This is what I want to be. My, uh, well, early on in, in, in life, like for me, you're, you're 16, right? So 
when I was your age, like I was very clear that this is what I wanted to do. And uh, I was fortunate enough to play basketball in college, which helped. But I also was very realistic with like my ability and or lack thereof. So I was I wanted to pursue this, um, I'd say, from the time I was a kid. And then that grew more and more. And by the time I was like a junior or senior in college, I was I had done some internships and I really knew that uh, I wanted to pursue this even though I wasn't sure what that meant in terms of was it going to be television, radio, print at that point, you know, I graduated college in 09. So, you know, the social media stuff really wasn't there. And um, uh, I, I just, I wanted to be in sports, you know, and I, I had decided at a pretty early age, Nathan, that I wanted to do the journalism side and not the team side. Cause it, it, when I was younger, I thought maybe, you know, it could be cool to be a coach or a GM or something, but, I, I just decided that I, I thought it'd be more dynamic for me to, to be on air and use my, try to use my you know personality more in that sense. Um, and then the first six months out of college, first year was really hard. I didn't get a job and I was doing this uh, unpaid blog on the side and that ended up doing relatively well and it won this, this award. And I think that helped me get in the door. So my first real opportunity was as a copy editor at Fan House and then about a year and a half out of school, I got my first like actual columnist opportunity at the Huffington Post. And that wasn't like a breakthrough because I don't think anybody knew who I was. But for me, it felt big because it validated some of the hard work and I was able to create my own voice. Yeah, one of the things you pointed out was kind of deciding your real ability was maybe not the best in basketball, which I feel like it would be such a hard thing for me to decide if I was good at basketball and played in college. But then I had to decide, well... I don't know if it's going to work out with me in the future. So what Very hard. was kind of the indecisive point with that? Yeah, it was really hard for me because I, I was a really hard worker. And I I, I always felt like uh, it would pay off. And it did to an extent. I, I thought I had a had a you know pretty good high school career and um, was able to play in college. But for me, like the, the, the awakening was um, probably like uh, sophomore year of high school. I started playing, you know, the competitive AAU circuit. And Seattle has great basketball. I think there's more NBA players from Seattle than any other city in the country. Um, and and my you know my year, my class, we had on my in my AU program, we had two lottery picks. We had Brandon Roy and Martel Webster. So I was working out with these guys as well as you know the Nate Robinsons and Jamal Crawfords, um, all these great players like every day, every week, and so. As soon as I really saw that, I remember thinking to myself, like, I, I'm just, it's never going to happen. You know, the NBA, let alone like high level professional basketball is, is just not in the cards for me. Um, and that was a really hard wake up call. And I tried to deny it. But the more, the further I got along in my career, especially in college, I just realized that there's just so many good players. And, um, you know, my opportunity was going to be outside of, you know, being off the court, but I, I, I wanted to soak up as much as I could. So I really used the playing to learn how to build relationships and to, uh, to try and take and extract my career on the court and see if that could help me off the court in terms of sharing information, under, understanding uh, plays, understanding what teams are trying to do. And I, I think that has helped me um, even if the actual basketball didn't work out. Yeah, do you think those connections and all you made with some of those players, do you think that's kind of helped you as well? It's, you know, this whole relationship, Nathan, is uh, this whole business, Nathan, is relationships. Um, integrity, obviously, you have to be able to, to make connections with people almost out of thin air because, you know, the word of mouth thing only happens when you're able to have enough people to vouch for you. But that first, those first several years when you're, coming out of college for me and not really knowing that many people was, was really difficult. So I had these relationships with like teammates and, you know, I knew some assistant coaches, but, but I, I felt like that ability to create these relationships with people from completely different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds um, was really helpful. And then it, it then, you know, parlayed itself into future opportunities in terms of meeting people, having the confidence to in, introduce myself and, and know that a lot of the time people were not going to be receptive because they didn't know who I was or I was, wasn't experienced enough or didn't have a name and just being okay with that and 
some of that's come back around and, and it's I've been able to forge relationships with people that weren't particularly receptive. Some of it hasn't. And just being OK with that is like half half the game. You know, like, It's like being OK with the fact that I wasn't a great basketball player. Um, now I'm like, OK, I'm not going to be able to have a relationship with every coach or every player. Um, and that's OK. And you just have to uh, really focus on the ones that, that you that you care about. And, and remember that, like this whole business, like I said, relationships. So if you can have that integrity and it's like a two way thing, I always say, like, I can't just call up a GM and expect them to give me information um, if I'm not maintaining that relationship because it needs to be a two way street, you know, and um, I'm still very green and learning. But I think that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I try to give young people like yourself who are getting into the business is, you know, it needs to be genuine and the relationships like anything else have to be watered. Yeah, I feel like that's one of the hardest things I've kind of gone through is keeping up with those relations I made. Like I've interviewed over 23 people. I, believe. Yeah, I was just looking on your feed. It's really impressive. Some some great people. Yeah, and I've, I've kept connections with about a good seven of them. And then it's most of them I don't keep up with or I'll hit them up randomly. I'll be like, Hey, how are you doing? Like, I need to keep up on it more. And I think like that's one of the hard things in this business is keeping up. with yeah. them. What do they say when you, when you reach out, are they, are they cool about it? Yeah. They're always cool about it. They always like one of the close ones I have is DJ Shauna and uh, her and I talk every now and then. And uh, do you know who Tyrell Terry is? Yeah. I mean, that guy's star. Yeah. His videographer, Mikey, uh, I talk to him a lot. Him and I play Xbox every single day. So he's That's awesome. Yeah. I can tell player. you that the, that the Mavs really, I mean, they, they're they high on him. I, he's he's going to be a really good player. Really good player. That's what I've heard, too, is uh, from Mikey, is that uh, they're really he's high on how good a player. player. Man. Over. Yeah, I'm excited for him to see what he does. But I've been able to play Xbox with him a few times, which is crazy at my point, kind of playing Xbox with NBA players like Edmund Yeah, Sanders absolutely. As well. Yeah. I see you got a, is that your dog in the background? No, that's my cat. She just came up. Right. Uh, so I, we have, I have two cats and two dogs. So I, I'm, I have one right over here. So that's why I was, I was laughing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I was kind of laughing about it in the background. I saw her come behind. I'm like, Oh man, this is not good. No, that's okay. I think it's, it adds to the uh, dynamic. But uh, with, I mean, I guess now we're on the point of animals. How hard is it to keep up with animals whenever you're kind of, focused on the business so much like you're always trying to keep up to date with new news and trying to stay with social media so how hard is it to kind of have a normal life yeah well uh it's a lot easier because you know my, my wife is um i mean she puts up with a lot and she's been incredibly supportive of my career especially you know early on when it, it wasn't uh off to a booming start and we have we have you know two young kids so um it's, it can be very difficult. And I really try between the kids and the animals and our family to, to be, uh, to be balanced, to be present. Uh, it's very difficult because, you know, there's a certain amount of texts you want to respond to, um, you know, being on Instagram, Twitter, just, and then reading, like, I, I really try to read a lot, not just ESPN. I'm, I'm always on different sites and, um, I'm just trying to soak up as much information. And then at night, you know, games are on late because I'm on the East Coast. So the West Coast games like NBA, those will tip at 1030. That's brutal. So um, I think uh, it is difficult, but uh, and it's a constant like struggle. It's always there. But I do think uh, the word balance, the two words balance and being present when you are with uh, family is, is very important. Yeah, and that's one of the tough things I feel like is watching those NBA games. Like we're doing this podcast, I try so much to do every now and then. I try to throw in debate segments with the co-host that I pick up randomly, and I'll just try to do debate segments. Yeah. You got these. I'm a huge Lakers fan. You got tip off at ten thirty. It's like I don't know. Brutal. And those games, games, you know, end at one, and, and and then you're like up. So I try to go to bed. I don't know about you, but like, and you're still in school. I try to go to bed. I usually go to bed by one, but. Uh, maybe twelve thirty. Yeah. How about you? I usually try to go to bed at eleven because I always have. So I swim. I don't play basketball, which is really swim weird. Is early. Those are early. Yeah, and I wake up at five a.m. for practice. So, and I have practice wow. after school. So, I always That's try to go to sleep at eleven with that. You you wake up at five a.m. and you go to the pool. Yeah, we swim or we do a weight room. Wow. Are you gonna swim in college? 
No, probably not. I fo- I plan on focusing on sports broadcasting in college. So. And where, where are you thinking about going? Are you looking at IU? I mean, they have a great school, obviously. Yeah, I'm looking at IU, Ball State, or even Syracuse up in New York. I mean, yeah, legendary. What about uh, do any of the other, like, Midwest, like, um, you know, Wisconsin or, uh, like, Illinois State, any of those schools? I, I have looked at, uh, I think it's Northern Kentucky or Northwestern. So North, was, Northwestern, amazing, yeah, yeah, amazing. They had Michael Wilbon there as one of their alumni. Yeah, really he went, he's like their their official spokesperson. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, that's like one of the. T- I would not have gotten in there uh, out of uh, out of high school. No way. It's a, that's very tough. If you can go to any of the schools we just talked about, uh, that'd be that'd be awesome, dude. I mean, going to a four year and establishing yourself, getting entrenched in the uh, journalism program is is enormous. Yeah, one of the biggest questions I have myself is kind of, do you think with like, with what I'm doing and starting out so young, because one of the things my parents always were like, you never know that right connection could get you where you don't have to go to college and right when you get out of high school, you can have a job position. That's do you think that's possible? Yeah, I think uh, for the first time, like that's a really relevant, you know, opportunity. And I think we've, like I've talked to people in the uh, in the music business a lot about it going not going to school like if you're it's no longer like you have to go to college I, you know I think when I graduated high school that was a big deal like going to college I think it's still a great thing but it's true that because of because of technology now and I mean even now during COVID like not having to be in an office or go to Bristol every week you can still get a lot of stuff done and I, I would always recommend going to college especially because like for journalism, you know, getting those reps, but uh, it's true. You don't, you don't have to do it. And uh, the connection thing is Trump's all. Like if you have a great connection, um, you, you have people in your corner, it can be extremely beneficial. Um, extremely a hundred percent. That's, that, that's true. Yeah. I plan on going to college though, but it's like with the power of social media, like we've watched how social media has benefited everybody between TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. I mean, yeah. I some guy on Twitter got an internship all because of his page he ran or, Aaron Cohen he runs the Lakers all day, every day page. He's got, yeah, I, I saw that as well. And that's a perfect example. That would never have happened even like five years ago. I don't think, you know, uh, it's changed. It's, it's really changed. And, you know, I mean, I'm obviously you're, you're motivated and if I can help, you know, help, help you facilitate some uh, relationships, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it. A lot of people, I think uh, a lot of, a lot of people in my position, you know, you have the opportunity now to uh, to do to do some of that, and people like yourself that are clearly motivated. If 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 you need a connection or you're looking to meet somebody, and I happen to know them, you know, I, I can definitely facilitate it. I don't know if it's worth not going to college over, but it could help. Yeah, no, I'd love to go to college because getting those reps in is important to me. And I yeah, mean- owning your voice, you know, and understanding if you want to be a writer, if you want to be behind the camera, in front of the camera, how. What is your voice? Like I've learned so much from just reps, you know, even, even not so good reps because um, that's how you figure out, like, this is what I want to be. Yeah. One of my bad moment of reps was I commentated hockey up in Detroit. And so driving all the way five hours up to Detroit, don't know anything about hockey, but not very well about anything about hockey. And I go up there to commentate. And I did a decent job, but it was hard at first because it's like trying to keep up with the pace of the game, trying to keep up with the timeouts and substitutions. Was this a Red Wings game? Do what? Was it Red Wings or minor league? What was it? It was like a minor league for the Metro Jets. Oh, my gosh. That's got to be brutal. Did you even know the players' names? No, I, I had no time to search up anything because it was just like – I can't believe you did that. I, I, don't, I don't think I – I mean, hockey's so fast. Yeah. It was I last can month, never. So. I mean, I could never have done that ever. Yeah. I got to the I was calling him by the numbers. I was like fifty. He, I was like fifty moves up. I was like fifty takes a shot on goal, and that's no good. Like just. It that's like the ball you did that. Uh, right. Remember the boom goes the dynamite video. You've yeah. seen that. The best. Speaking of Ball State, I think that was the Ball State. You know, local station. You know. Uh, Trust me, hockey, I think hockey, I've always said hockey and then baseball are the two artists. Because baseball yeah. is so much better you have to yeah. fill. 
Yeah, that's why I I don't think I can do baseball at all because baseball, like you said, it's is slow. It's, it's very slow game. Nine innings. You got a lot of stories, and you got to really love the game. You, yeah. Whatever you're doing, though, like anything, you have to love it, you know. And and uh, if you're passionate about it, you'll find a way to make it work, even if you're not a hundred percent comfortable. Yeah, that's what my goal is: is to kind of be like an ESPN analyst or doing like inside the NBA for TNT type thing like that. So that's kind of my end goal is if as long as I'm up there working for ESPN one day, I'll be more than happy. But I text you with, um, with, you know, Adam Lefko. Yeah, yeah. So he does the inside the NBA like, uh, I, you know, he's not on the show with Kenny and them. He's on their like young show with, with Dwayne Wade and them. We, we do a, a card show together, like trading cards. He's a, yeah. we've worked a lot he's a really good buddy if you want i'll, I'll connect you he, he could be someone he's a cool fun guy good, good guy yeah, for you to know definitely yeah i sent guys. out a message a couple weeks ago i think it was right before i sent the message out to you i sent a message out to him kind of going through possible Did he respond no he hasn't responded no okay i'm gonna i'm i'm, I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna fix that because he's he's a great guy and i'm sure he would be happy to connect and we'll give him shit for it all right, that sounds good. That sounds amazing. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. But um, so now here you are, you're working for ESPN. And was that ever a goal of yours to be an ESPN analyst or was it just a goal of yours just to make it in the business completely? For me, it was, it was always the goal, 100%. Uh, as a kid, I always wanted to be on ESPN. Like that's, it was always the the apex for me. I, you know, I I'd like, <laughs> when I was a kid, like you'd, you'd wake up before school and watch the reruns of the sports center the night before because they didn't have a fresh show. And if I hadn't caught the whole show, then I would a hundred percent, I would always wake up in the morning regardless. But if I hadn't caught the whole show, cause it was too late. They had like, they had their like, I don't know, mid, midnight Eastern. It was just nine o'clock, which is late on the West coast as a kid. So I would watch the next morning. I'd get up early before school and watch it. And I always thought Nathan, that being an ESPN, you know, was, uh, was like, uh, the pinnacle and I, and I now that I've been there this is going on my third year I see why it's so coveted you know it's such a massive platform and they've obviously you know they, they've created an industry really um, it's also a really big place and it, it can be easy to get lost and so for me it's it's always trying to push forward get more opportunities present myself in a certain light but also being, you know, respectful of people that have been there a long time and created their own like much bigger identity. So it's a it's a tricky thing, and it's a really I love it, but I I wasn't prepared for how big it is because it is that big. Yeah, what's one of the like biggest celebrities for ESPN that you've met so far there? I think. Uh, because I, I you know I, before COVID I would go up and do I do the daily wager few days a week which is their you know betting show and it's so it's an espn2 show from six to seven eastern night so it's a great slot and after i did it once uh i finished and then i came down to the cafeteria to get dinner before going back to the hotel and sure enough it's scott van pelt and for me you know having your own show and in his case you know his own show uh his own sports center show at midnight eastern five days a week i mean it doesn't get any bigger you know, he's like uh, Tom Brokaw for me of sports. So, um, and I, and, and the daily wager, we have Stanford Steve on sometimes. So I was talking to him and I kind of stepped up to him and, you know, this is me again, I'll trying to like, this is how I would, how I try to create this relationship. I just kind of meander over there, even though there's a lot of other seats. And I just said, uh, you know, Hey fellas, you mind if I, if I sit down and they were great. It was Stanford Steve, Scott Van Powell and their whole production team. I must have been 10 guys. And we had a great dinner, a lot of laughs. And I was like, all right, you know, have a good night. And then Scott said, do you want to come back and watch the games with us? Because that's what we're going to do for the next three hours for the show. And I was like, great. So we went back and watched the playoffs. Um, you know, just, it was like the coolest experience. There must have been, it was this big room right in the, 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 the floor below his studio. Must you know everybody was in there, 10 guys, eight, 10 TVs, all the games on, you know, and I'm sitting across from probably the biggest anchor they have, just 
talking sports and he said, Hey, what do you think of that? And I was like, me? And he said, yeah, what do you think about that? And I don't even remember what it was, but I remember him asking me a question and I was like, so excited to share my you know, opinion. Uh, so that was fun. That was a really fun night. And that was, um, let's see, that was, yeah. I mean, that was before COVID. I haven't really had opportunities like that since, but I remember thinking like how cool that was. And then the next morning, I think I co-hosted Golik and Wingo as a guest host before that show went off the air. And I remember thinking like uh, what a surreal, like 12 hours it was to watch the playoffs with Scott Van Pelt. Um, and then the next morning host this, this big show. Uh, and then of course uh, I went home and I said to my parents, what do you think? And they said, you were awful. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it was fun. It was really fun. But yeah, I feel like that's a lot more that, well, that's Sapar. Uh, superior compared to my meeting with one of the biggest one I've met was Mike Wells from ESPN and uh, I met uh, him. Colts yeah it does the Colts yeah yeah I met him at an Indianapolis conference for broadcasting students and uh, I go there to his meeting and my teacher's like hey you would really like this one this would be a good connection for you to make but here it is pre-pandemic and I go up there and I'm like sweating from my armpits. I as soon as I get out of there, I check my pits, and like my pets are drenched because this is the first <laughs> first I've ever met. That's awesome. That's and awesome. Uh, I remember shaking his hand, and like my hand was shaking, all that, and I was just kind of like geeking out inside because I was like, "Wow!" I was like, "There's no way I just met an ESPN analyst." And uh, that awesome. was pretty cool. I pitched. Well, this was when I had the shot clock originally. It was supposed to be a studio show for this ISC Sports Network in Indiana. And um, I pitched the show idea to him. I was like, hey, I was like, what do you think of this? And originally it was going to be like, you had like so much time to debate a topic, kind of like part of the interruption, but then there's going to be halftime, timeouts, uh, overtime and all that. What do you, well, how'd it go? Yeah. And he was like, I love that idea. That's a great idea. He's like, you ought to pitch that to him and hope that turns out well. He's like, just, and I was asking him like, what tips did you give me? He's like, you just got to present yourself, be you, try to use your, yeah, use your voice. And yeah, uh, that's so that was a, it didn't happen because of COVID? No. So what happened was once COVID hit, it was supposed to be on high school sports, and uh, COVID hit, and then all the tournaments got canceled. So, yeah, all the tournaments got canceled, and right. then we just weren't able to air the show because there was just no point in airing it. Right. Yeah, that's, I, that's good advice, you know. Um, Sorry for that. There's connection issues on the part, and we are not able to finish this podcast. If you like more of what you see, go ahead and go follow the podcast on Instagram at the Shot Clock Pod. Follow me on Instagram at Nathan Shaw at Nathan R Shaw, or follow Jordan Schultz on Instagram at Jordan Schultz. So thank you guys for watching the Shot Clock Podcast. As always, I'm blessed to do this, and uh, thank you guys for listening.